Um, without further ado, I'm going to um, hand this over to Sarah, Sarah Edwards and um, her Braille 101 uh, presentation for us. So take it away, Sarah. Thank you. I am trying to pop that up to share. Thank you, Alaya. I appreciate um, you always having Julie and I join you for this series. Um, today, it is just me. Julie is not with us today. as She had another um, appointment. Um, so today we're going to talk about Braille 101. And um, before we get started, I just want to clarify that this webinar is um, to teach the basics, basics of Braille um, to sighted individuals. So I think on social media, there might have been some misunderstanding. Um, I won't be sharing any strategies on how to teach younger kids Braille. Um, there are some recorded webinars out um, under APH's Family Connect, as well as ISVI's um, Birth to Three program that Julie and I have um, done previously um, to teach those strategies. But today I'm going to focus on really just the basics of Braille for um, sighted individuals who would like to know. So without further ado, we will get started. Um, I want to start out with by saying why we should learn Braille. Um, to give you that answer, I'll give you a little background about me. I am a parent of two children who are visually impaired. They both have Lieber's congenital amaurosis. Um, my son, Ethan, is 18, and my daughter just recently turned 16. So when they were younger, just, you know, babies and toddlers, and we were trying to figure out what this world was, you know, what we were going to do with two children who had visual impairments and were trying to navigate and find out, you know, what direction we needed to take. This was one area that I often thought of, like, well, who's going to help them? Who's going to support them in the home if nobody knows Braille? And I will tell you, I was not a teacher for the visually impaired back when my, when my kids were babies. Um, but I was very concerned as to when they start school, you know, they would bring worksheets home and I understood that their worksheets were going to be adapted in Braille. Um, if I didn't know Braille, if my husband didn't know Braille, then how were we going to help them? How were we going to support them? So I started um, taking it upon myself just to learn Braille on my own, um, just the basics, you know, the alphabet, just so I could like piece <laughs> words together, um, very basic. And then when my daughter, Elissa, turned three and started an early childhood program, that is actually when um, I went back to school and got my teacher certificate to teach um, children who are visually impaired. And that is what I do today. Um, so while I was in that program, I was able to learn more of the code um, you know, through that program. So I do believe it's very important to learn Braille uh, when we have kiddos in the home who have complete vision loss. Um, I think that having a caregiver who models Braille reading and writing um, definitely increases the likelihood of a child's success as a Braille reader or writer. Um, most oftentimes our kiddos are the only ones in the classroom reading and writing Braille. Um, that can be very isolating. You know, they might have two desks because they've got the Braille writer and they've got these big, enormous books. I mean, anybody that's been around Braille knows that it's very space consuming. Um, so they do, they kind of stick out. There's no way to hide it. Um, so like I said, it can be very isolating. A lot of times we hear, you know, younger kids, they don't want to learn Braille, especially if they have some functional vision. You know, they would rather not learn Braille because you know, it makes them different and they don't want to stick out. So if we as caregivers in the home can model great, you know, braille reading and writing, then we're telling them, you know, we're showing them that it's okay and it's important and it matters, you know, braille matters and they as an individual, as a person matters and we're there to support them in this process. Also, if we learn Braille, then we have the opportunity to label objects in our home, which then helps create a language rich environment. So when we think about our sighted peers as they're growing up, you know, there's print all over, they're submerged in print. 
You know, they open up a book, it's print. They watch TV, there's print. Um, they go for a car ride and look outside, you know, and all the, all the store signs or all the billboards, there's all print. So even though they may not be able to know what that says and they're not able to read, they are submerged in a print world. So for our children who have complete vision loss and are not able to see all of that print, then we need to bring that world to them. So we need to submerge them in a world with Braille. And we can do that by producing labels and um, put those labels around our home to help create that language rich environment, which then helps develop different concepts and speech and language. Also, you can write notes to your child in Braille. You know, that was one of the things I thought about how parents, um, you know, can leave cute little notes, uplifting notes in their child's backpack or lunchbox or just in their room, you know, just to make them smile and, um, you know, give them a positive throughout the day. Well, for our children who are not able to access print, how do we do that? So if we know how to um, write Braille, even just a very simple note, and I love you, then we can drop those notes, you know, in our child's lunch boxes or Braille packs or backpacks and give them a smile throughout their day because they deserve that as well. Um, now that they're older, my children, and, you know, leaving notes is sometimes um, preferable over waking them up by a text or a phone, you know, on a Saturday morning, I want to go somewhere. I forgot to tell them the night before. So I don't want them waking up. They know that I'm not here, but they have no idea where I've gone or how long I'm how long I'm going to be gone. Um, I don't want to text them or call them because all of their devices will start ding, 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 ding and wake them up. And, you know, we wouldn't want to wake a teenager up before noon on a Saturday. So, you know, we have a place um, on our countertop or a designated place on the refrigerator where I can just leave a little braille note, you know, ranch the store, be back in an hour or something. So um, those are just other reasons why it's nice to, to know even just the basics of braille. Also, you can help your child scribble on a braille writer. So perhaps when they're younger and they have a braille writer at home. And when we say scribble, that's really just them kind of playing around and getting used to the keys and strengthening those hands and fingers. Um, while doing so, you can support, you know, their learning. Um, look, you made an A, you made a B, you know, you, the full cell. Um, so you, you have some of that basic knowledge to help them um, learn some of those basics of Braille. And that just helps generalize the skills in between the classroom and the home. And lastly, it's a bonding opportunity. Um, like I mentioned before, you know, we really need to show them that Braille is important. Um, it is not dead, as some people like to say. Um, it's still a very um, important in the classroom, especially when they're younger. I mean, when they're older, there's obviously other ways to access material that's more efficient, um, but I still very much support Braille. Um, I think it's a great bonding opportunity with the kiddos and, and let them know that they are important, it's important, and um, it's something that you can learn together. So with all of that being said, today we are just going to do a quick overview of, like I said, the Braille basics. We're not going to go into the whole entire code. Um, obviously, I work with a very much younger population in the zero to three. So even though at one time I knew the Braille code, I definitely have a cheat sheet for anything um, past the basics that we're going to go over today. So today we're just going to go over the alphabet, numbers, punctuation, some of the punctuation, again, not all, um, the alphabet word signs, and then the contractions that consist of and, for, of, the, and with. And I will show you later on, this is just a dent in the braille code. This is um, by no means the entire braille code. Okay, so let's start with what a braille cell is. In case you're not familiar with what a braille cell is. Um, braille symbols are formed within a unit of space known as a braille cell. And a braille cell consists of six raised dots arranged in two parallel columns, each column having three dots. So I hope you can see this. Actually, this might be better. This might be a little more 
camera. Sorry, should have practiced this. So this is a Braille cell. It has um, six dots, two parallel columns, each consisting of three dots. And the dots are one, two, three, four, five, six. So this is considered a Braille cell. So the dot positions are identified by the numbers one through six, like I just showed you, one, two, three, four, five, six. And there's a total of 64 combinations um, that are possible using one or more of these six dots. So with the combination of these six dots within a Braille cell, we can make a, an alphabet letter, a number, a punctuation mark, or even a whole word. Like I had mentioned prior, we're going to talk about some of those alphabet word contractions. So just within these six dots, we could represent an entire word in addition to an, a letter, number, or punctuation mark. So this is a braille cell. I hope you can see that. So now let's talk about how the six, oops, sorry. Um, how the six dots in a braille cell are represented on a braille writer. So if you're not familiar with a braille writer, I have a picture on the left lower hand corner. This is an American printing house braille writer, Perkins braille writer, um, very heavy and can be clunky. This is what I was talking about. Sometimes our kiddos in the classroom need additional space because they have all their materials plus the braille writer. Um, and it has six keys. As you can see the diagram here, it has six keys and with um, divided by a space bar. It has additional keys too, but we're not gonna go into that to, right now. So the purpose of this is to talk about how the braille or the cell or the dots, I'm sorry, are represented on a braille writer because that can be very confusing. So this is my egg carton <laughs> that I've made into a braille cell. So a braille cell, like I just mentioned, one, two, three, four, five, six. So when you are reading braille, whether you're reading it by touch with your fingers or whether you're reading it by sight, which is what we do, this is what we are coming across, a braille cell. So um, a letter A is dot one. So if I'm reading, that's not very good contrast. So if I'm reading, ah, if I'm reading braille, this dot would be raised, dot one, that's an A. So how do I make, how do I write a letter A on a braille writer? I'm going to press down the key with the one on. So that's how the dots in a braille cell are represented on a braille writer. The cell or the dots are linear, so I do a swing cell. It's kind of hard to describe. So for example, a C, right? A C is dots one and four. So in Braille reading, dots one and four is a C as I read it. To make a C, I'm going to press down the two middle keys that are separated by the space bar. So that's how the dots on a cell or the dots in a braille cell are represented on a braille writer. So it can be confusing as you learn how to read and write braille. So when you're writing braille, I remember when I first started, I would mentally have to stop and think one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, so it takes a lot of thought um, to, to organize as to which cell corresponds with the key. So if you do start learning, um, you can always just make little cheat sheets on the keys and, and number them one, two, three, four, five, six, um, until you become accustomed to how the dots um, line up on a, on a braille writer. So I just really quick before I go into learning the alphabet, are there any questions? Hey, Sarah. Yes, this is Aliyah. Okay. Um, we have a question. Um, Elizabeth wants to know, do you press them all at the same time? Good question. Thank you. 
Yes, if you, so let's go back to our C, that's one and four, right? So I'm gonna press those keys, one and four. Those have to be pressed simultaneously. Those have to be pressed at the same time in order to make a C. If you don't, you're going to have two separate spaces. Um, if I want to make a G, one of my favorites, it's always fun to write a G because it's dots one, two, four, and five. So you get to press down four keys. So to make a G, I have to press keys one, two, four, and five all at the same time. Okay. Any more before we move on, Alaya? Yes, ja uh, Jamilet had a, she, oh, can you hear me? Can you hear me, Sarah? I can, I oh, okay. You. It was weird. It was like, I, I could see my mic moving, but then there was a message saying to unmute my mic. So I was like, hmm, okay. okay. <laughs> I know it's weird. Uh, Jamilet had a question or had her hand up. Um, and so I was just typing in the chat to ask her to, um, put her question in the chat, but there is another question. Do you typically use both hands like you would a keyboard? You do. Yes. Another good question. Yes. So, um, your left hand and it would be, um, these three fingers on each on well on your left and right hand these are the three fingers that you're pr primarily going to use so my pointer finger um, on my left hand is going to be on key one right my middle finger on two and then my next on three and then four four five six so one two three four five six and that's those are the six fingers that you primarily use while writing Braille, both hands. Okay. Um, okay, here was a, there's another question here. Uh, if you make a mistake, do you have to delete all of the cells to begin again? Oh, very good question. Um, okay, so it depends on how big of a mistake. <laughs> so um, usually- <laughs> so, I, know, I, I know what you mean. <laughs> yes, so if it's just, okay, so let's say I wanted to um, make an A, right? And <clears throat> I accidentally pressed, um, so an A is dot one, but my fingers got crazy and I pressed dots one and two. So if I just accidentally hit an X and made an extra dot, I would, what we call, we rub it out. Um, and there is a little, we call it a braille eraser. I should have, I should have had one. Shoot, I think it's another room I don't wanna leave, but I have a picture later on. I have a picture mm -hmm. later on with a slate and stylus. So it'll, um, so remind me to point out what this is, but it's a little eraser that it's, it's basically wooden and it has a point and you can rub out, you can flatten that out. You can also use your fingernail. A lot of times I'll just scratch yep, out that about to extra say, dot. Sometimes. <laughs> yeah, you just use what yeah. you can, just yeah. scratch that dot out and make it, you know, yeah. flat. If yeah. it's, a big mistake, really big, and you don't want to sit there and scratch it out, then you go back and what you do, what we call a full cell. So you press all six dots, just jump, 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 and just you base over your mistake. So you full cell that whole word or that whole line. Um, and so those, those full cells will just say, ignore. Move it's almost on. like a strikeout, right? Yeah. Like you're like drawing a line through your mistake instead yes. you're putting the Braille cells over. Okay. Yes. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, there's another question for a child with poor fine motor. Is there an easier way to type Braille? Oh, that is a lie. You might be able to touch because APH has the light touch. Braille. Right. There, there is one that's light touch, but there's also something called a mount batten. Mm, um, yes. and, um, I don't think we have those at APH, um, but I, I'll look for the link for the Mountbatten and I'll put it in the chat box. Um, the Mountbatten works a little bit easier because it's bigger and it's more spread out. Mm -hmm. So the kids don't have to have their, 
little fingers, you know, trying to get them all on those, on those keys. Um, I've used um, those, um, there's key like extenders. little connectors. There's key oh, that, yeah. extenders too, key that extenders. I think will help if you have some fine motor. Cause it does, it does take a lot of finger strength to press those keys down. Yeah. So it's particularly when um, the little ones are learning, I mean, it's not uncommon for them to kind of poke and peck, right? With their stronger fingers, because you know, our other fingers aren't fingers that we typically use to press down. Um, but there, there are, I thought some key extenders that help with that as well. I'll, I'll look up the key extenders and the Mountbatten and put the links to those in the chat. I've also used the Unifix cube blocks like that, that connect together their little squares. And I, I um, Velcroed them to the keys. So the kids, when they put their finger, they can put their fingers in the little cubes themselves and it helps keep their fingers on the keys. But if they have difficulty with fine motor that might not work as well, but um, but yes, I will put in the Mountbatten and the key extender information um, to help um, with kids like that. That way, if you need to purchase it or look for where to get it, um, you'll have that information. That's a good question. Yes, it is. Very good question. Um, and then let's see, um, what do I what do I learn for? Uh, excuse me. What do I learn first to read or write? Oh. I, um, you're asking as an well, individual, not as a student, like for me personally, I learned how to read it mm -hmm. before I learned how to write it. Um, I think you'd almost have to learn how to read it before you actually wrote it because you'd have to have the understanding of where your dots are before you could, you know, figure out right. which keys you need to press. Right. And I mean, and, and I was going to ask, is that from the perspective of the person with sight learning to read the Braille by sight mm -hmm. or the, the child who is blind learning whether we, they should learn to read first or write first? Yeah, because I'm thinking that yeah. my children learned how to read and write Braille like simultaneously. Yeah, with yeah. kids is more yeah. simultaneous. But I as mean. a sighted yeah. individual, I would have to say I learned how to read it before writing it. I did too. I mean, as a sighted individual, yeah, I learned how to read it first mm -hmm. before I even got into the writing of it. So yeah, um, hopefully that answers um, your question, Paul. Um, thank you, Shelly. She put in the link um, to it, um, where to find the, um, the uh, extension keys um, at, at, from Perkins. So that's in the chat box for everybody. Perfect. Okay. Thank All right. you. Uh-huh. That's the last question for now. All right, then we will move on. So now we are actually going to start in learning how to write, read and write. Well, actually, we're not gonna practice how to write, sorry. We're gonna learn how to read the alphabet and we will start with the first 10 letters. So this is the time where if you saw the description and you know if you have a, a six muffin pan or um, a little six um, egg carton, or I showed you earlier, you probably wouldn't have this, but I wanted to share this because I found this at the Dollar Tree yesterday. And this is a great um, little tool to learn how to read Braille. It's actually an art palette. It's an art palette with the six openings. So I grabbed almost all the packages at my local Dollar Tree. There's six in a package. And then I was able to... Um, to number those accordingly. So this is just a nice little tool to share with parents if you're um, teachers as well. Um, if you don't have any tools and you wanna kind of play along with us as we learn how to um, make the letters of the alphabet and numbers, um, you could just make six circles on a piece of paper, rip up a couple scraps, you know, and you could move those little pieces of paper around on the six dots according to what letters that we're going to, to read and write. So, <clears throat> Excuse me. So we'll start with the first 10 letters. Um, obviously, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, and J. And <clears throat> here on this screen, excuse me, I have the print letter. And then up above it, I have what that letter looks like in Braille. So let's practice. So to make a letter A, I'm going to move my camera. I don't, or maybe if I scoot back here. Okay. 
So to make a letter A is dot one. So it's just the top, top set, the top cell, dot one. To make a B is one, two, To make a C is one, four. To make a D is one, four, five. To make an E is one, five. To make an F is one, two, four. And to make a, oh wait, did I not, sorry. Did I not have that right? I'm trying to do this backwards. One, two, and four is F. And then like I mentioned earlier, one of my favorites is a G. One, two, four, and five. And H is one, two, and five. And I is two and four. And I will say sometimes it's very common for people to get E and I switched um, because an E is one five and an I is two four. So one little um, clue that I always use is a one five goes down. So we always say um, I to the ground. So E I like I to the ground, E Y E is going down. And then an I goes up and we say I up to the sky. If you think about it that way. And then a J is two, four, and five. So those are the first 10 letters of the alphabet. So before we move on, to the next 10 letters, which is K through T, I want you to look at the first row of Braille letters, A through J, and compare it to the second row of Braille letters, K through T, and see if you can come up with what, there's a constant change, and see if you can find what that constant change is. So if you noticed, when you look at row one and compare it to row two, to make this next set of letters, the next 10 letters, all we're doing is adding dot three. So A is dot one, K is dot one, three, B is dots one and two, L dots one, two, three and so forth. So basically to make the second set of 10 letters, all we're doing is adding dot three. All right, so are you ready to practice? We have these balls rolling all over. Should have got a second muffin pan here. <laughs> all right, so a K. A is one, three. And L is one, two, three. And M is one, three, four. And N is one, three, 
four, five. And O is one, three, five. P is one, two, three, four. A Q is one, two, three, four, and five. And R is one, two, three, five. And S is two, three, four. And a T is two, three, four, and five. All right, and we'll go over the final six letters. Before we do the final six, again, I want you to look at the second row of um, Braille letters, K through T. Look at the second row and compare those to row three and see if you can find the constant there. So what we are doing to move from row two to row three is we're adding dot six. So um, with the exception of W, and the reason is, is because there was no W in the French alphabet. Uh, alphabet. You know, Louis Braille invented the Braille code and he's French and there's no W. So um, W is the exception to the rule. Um, so as you can see, if you go back to K, K is dots one and three, and U is one, three, six. L is one, two, three, and V is one, two, three, six. So we will um, do the final six, but before I move on, just because this is the last time I'll have this slide up, I also wanted to point out, and this may just be me, but when I look at the print letter and look at the braille letter, it always appears to me that it's somewhat of an image of that actual letter. So sometimes that helps as we're looking. Um, for example, look at J. I feel like the Braille J looks like a J and the S looks like an S and the T looks like a T. So just as you're moving along, you can kind of get your mindset and see that it's kind of a, a visual image of the print letter. So let's practice the final six letters and we are going to start with you. Move my camera again. Maybe. Hold that up. Okay, so you. One, three, six. V is one, two, three, six. W. W is the mirror image of an R. W is three, four, five, six. X, this is always a favorite. I like G, I also like X, easy to remember. X, one, three, sorry, <laughs> one, three, four, six. Why? One, three, four, five, six. And Z is one, three, five, six. Okay. 
So that is the Braille alphabet. Are there any questions before we move on to the numbers? I think we're good. No, sorry, I was like, what? I can't unmute myself. <laughs> um, there is a question. Um, what are the balls made of that you are using? Yes. So you can use tennis balls. Um, a lot of times if you're working with someone you too that has low vision, the, the tennis balls like the yellow are, are good for high contrast. These are actually just wiffle balls. Um, and I was at the Dollar Tree and you can get three in one. So a couple blocks and I was able to make a braille cell. Um, and then I just wrote the numbers on the wiffle ball. Nice. Yeah, that's it's uh, the, uh, the dollar store is amazing. Um, Paul, I see you have your hand up. Can you um, type your question in the chat? Okay, for now. Oh, here we go. Um, Valerie has a question. How would you adapt this for a child in phase two? Uh, it looks like she meant to put two to three in yeah. CVI. Um, definitely high contrast, if that's what you're thinking. Um, I'm trying to think because I'll just be real honest. I've never with the kiddos that I work with, I've never had to do this with anyone in that phase. Um, I guess I would need to know maybe more about your student, like, uh, as far as are they tactual? You know, do we need to like, to actually explore the placement, spray paint the pie pan and use, yeah, I would, like you said, the high contrast, I would definitely use those yellow um, tennis balls in my braille training. I adapted use of bottle tops. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, um, and even like this little, this art palette tray that's white um, and I numbered, and then these are just those um, like little spiky balls, ouch. <laughs> and if, I, if I move my camera down, I mean, this is smaller, so it might be I'm trying to get it to where it won't, um, might be better for little hands and it's more, you know, they're not such big, large areas that they're having to explore with so much more space, but you could probably on this, like out, I would outline these dots so that it would stick out. I should have done that. Like you could, you know, highlight around each of these circles to stick out. And these are just those little spiky balls that you could use for contrast, or this actually fits. I have ping pong balls with me there. Um, I couldn't find my orange ping pong, ping pong balls. These actually have little eyeballs on them. Um, but the orange ping pong balls would actually be really good for contrast in a little tray like this too. Okay, let's see. Um, Brenda had a, a comment about um, about the CVI, um, like the contrast issue. Uh, spray paint the pie pan and use yellow tennis balls or uh, spray the uh, pie pan black and use yellow tennis balls. I guess it would just depend on like the toxicity of the spray paint because the babies are going to put that in their mouths. Right. Oh, so shoot. We'd have to be careful with that. Uh, but that is a good idea. Um, or maybe using tape color, like black tape or red tape um, to fill in the holes. Um, I don't know. I mean, that, that would be, that would be a neat thing to do, Sarah, just to see how, like, how we would make it like something like that, that would be safe for the kiddos since, you know, they're going to put it in their mouths. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> uh, but I do, that is. You a, could get a, a like, idea. if you didn't want to use paint, sorry, my, I moved my screen and I got <laughs> messed up. Um, instead of using paint, you could um, use like black contact paper and place that over the pan and then cut out your circles. Oh, that's true. That would be another way. I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I would definitely try that before I did paint for sure, but I mm -hmm. like that idea. Um, let's see, somebody had another comment. In my braille training, I adopted use of bottle caps, and that was from Paul. That was That's his good comment. Idea too. Mm -hmm. Just again, be careful that that baby that you know they won't swallow them or put them in their mouths and choke. The right. bottle tops are kind of small. 
Um, but yeah, that is still a good idea. Okay. All right. That's it for now, Sarah. All right. So we're going to move on um, to numbers. So in order to identify numbers, we have to have a number indicator or a number sign that lets the blind reader know that um, it's, it's a number that they are supposed to be reading and a letter. And that's because letters A through J give us numbers zero through nine. So as you can see, A is one, B is two, C is three, D is four, E is five, F is six, G is seven, H is eight, I is nine, and J is zero. So how they know that that's a number that they're coming across rather than a letter is the use of a number indicator. And the number indicator is um, um, three, four, five, and six. So that is basically our number sign. You only need to use one number indicator, whether you have one number or multiple numbers. So, um, you know, if it's one, then we're gonna have a number indicator and then the A. That tells us it's not an A, but it's number one, okay? If it's 12, we only need one indicator and dots one and two, which they all fell out. So again, it does not matter if that number is one number, or multiple numbers, you, you just have one number, no, ugh, one number indicator and the indicator is three, four, five, and six. And that tells the person as they're reading along, oh, that's not just a G standing out there, that's a number seven. All right, then we are going to go over just basic punctuation. So a capital a capital is just dot six. So if I write my name, obviously we capitalized, you know, the first letter of our name. So I would write, I would um, press down dot six and then I would make an S A R A and that would tell them that the S is capitalized. So the first letter is capitalized. So a capital, capital indicator is dot six. A period is a period is two, five, and six. So you can use that at the end of a sentence, in between initials, you know, abbreviations u dot s dot a dot you know you'd have three periods in there um so that is two five and six that's a period an exclamation mark two three five a question mark two, three, six. And a comma is just a dot two. So again, this is just their very basic punctuation. There's a lot more punctuation and I'm going to show you a cheat sheet that will show you all of the punctuation, but I'm not, I'm not going to kid you folks, because I still use my cheat sheet on the basic punctuation. I think it's just as I get older, I tend to forget, but like the exclamation mark and the question mark, those are mere, like I get those flipped around a lot. So I've got two pros here in the household. I also ask them a lot of questions. All right, so let's move on to the alphabet word signs. Um, so, in Braille, we have contracted Braille and uncontracted Braille. So today we're going over like the, um, the uncontracted Braille, meaning every, it's like letter for letter. So when you spell out a word, you're using every letter to spell out that word. So hand, H-A-N-D, that's uncontracted Braille. And that's typically what um, a lot of our kiddos will start learning. And that's 
when you learn the alphabet that's uncontracted. But within the Braille code, there are numerous contractions, or I call them shortcuts or shorthand, um, because you have to think too, like Braille, like I said, is so space consuming, we have to kind of narrow this down somewhat, right? So most of the letters in the alphabet, if they are standing alone, they also represent a word. So for example, B, but, C, can, D, do, E, every, goes on and on and on. L, like, you know, T, that. You can read through the list here. I don't want to sit here and read something that you can all read yourself. The idea is that if these letters are standing alone, the Braille reader has learned, um, they've learned these alphabet word signs and then by using you know, the context around them, they understand, oh, that's not just a Z sitting out there all by itself, that's the word as, you know, or, oh, that's not a V, just that, that wasn't just a typo, that's standing for the word very. So those are what we call alphabet word signs. Then in Braille, we also have what we call part and whole word contractions. And those are and, for, of, the, and with. And when we say part and whole word contractions, because let's look at the first one. So dots one, two, three, five, and six stand for the word and, oh, I'm sorry, one, two, three, four, and six. Goodness. Okay. So one, two, three, four, and six stands for the entire word and. So this could be completely by itself. They're reading along, they come across this contraction with the context and everything. They know that this is the word and. They can also use this contraction within a word. So for example, candy, C-A-N-D-Y. Rather than spelling that out, C-A-N-D-Y, five letters, five spaces, they can write candy in three spaces. They can write C-A-N-D-Y, okay? Or hand. Rather than four spaces, four letters, H-A-N-D, they can write hand in two spaces, H-A-N-D. And they can do the same thing with the words for, of, the, and with. So for, um, F-O-R, can stand alone, or um, fort, F-O-R-T, they can use the contraction F-O-R, and then add on T. So instead of four spaces, they've condensed it to two. So those are your part or whole word contractions. All right, this is the cheat sheet. Um, you can Google this and, and find many cheat sheets. This um, I have a printout at home that I've had for um, 15 years and um, I'll, Actually, in the last year, I framed it <laughs> because I needed to keep it and it's handy. So um, you can see here that what we've gone over today is by no means um, the entire bra Braille code. Um, this cheat sheet gives you um, the alphabets and numbers in the top left hand corner. And then it also um, gives you all of the contractions besides what we went over today. Um, there's also code to let you know if something needs to be italicized, underlined, um, bold, or script. Um, if you look in the middle, you can see that there's the alphabet word signs that we went over today and those part and whole word contractions. And uh, you can also see that there's a lot of contractions that we did not go over today. They, um, it would just, it's just so time consuming, but there's contractions for um, the combination of letters like CH, SH, TH, or, you know, EE, BB in the lower group signs. 
Um, and the reason we call these lower group signs is because the, the cells or the dots used are represented in the lower part of the Braille cell. So um, in the uh, two, three, five, and six cells. So dots one and four are not used to use those lower group signs or those lower word signs. And then there's also what they're called initial letter contractions. I call them dot five contractions or that's how it was taught to me. Um, so it takes the initial letter, for example, day, it uses D, but if you put a dot five in front of it, it's not a D, it stands for day. Or an E, a dot five in front of an E stands for ever, dot five in front of an N stands for mother, dot five in front of Q stands for question. So there's a lot of different shortcuts. Um, as you can go down, you see dot five um, in front of some of those um, um, letter combinations will also give you words. And then you have four, five, and six contractions at the very bottom there for cannot, cannot had many spirit world in there. There's contractions for your final letter group sounds like O-U-N-D, A-N-C-E, S-I-O-N, E-N-C-E. And then there's short form words. So there's a whole list of words that we do not need to spell out. Um, there's, you know, there's shortcuts to write those words. For example, Braille, we do not need to say B-R-A-I-L-L-E. -L -L -E. We can write B-R-L and that's a shortcut for Braille or friend. Instead of F-R-I-E-N-D, we can write F-R or receive R-C-V. So as you can see, there's a whole list of short form words there. Okay, um, I wanted to pick up a, or add a couple different resources before um, I show you some different equipment that you can use to write Braille within your home um, very inexpensively, but a couple resources you can learn um, Braille. One is Dots for Families. This is developed by Penny Rosenblum of the Arizona State University. What is it called again? Dots for Families. Dots for Families. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I have the link here. Um, I don't know if I can. It's in Paths to Literacy. I don't think I can copy it from my. Seeing if I can copy it. And, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't think it's going to let me. Um, you That's can okay, find I'm, it. I'll work on it. Okay. It's within Paths to Literacy. Um, it's a self-paced lesson. There's about 15 in total. There's no instructor, no homework. You can just follow the lessons on your own pace. Um, this is a great resource. I share this. Um, most of my families that want to learn Braille on their own time um, use this resource and it's been wonderful. Somebody has, oh, oh yep. you got it. Yeah, Perfect. I put it on there. Um, okay. go ahead. There's a question, but go ahead and then let me know when you're ready. Okay. I, let me, I'll just do the couple mm -hmm. other resources before I do mm -hmm. the final section and then we'll, um, Perky Duck. So Perky Duck is a free computer program. It, um, allows your computer keyboard to simulate a Braille writer. So this is good for practicing the Braille writer. If you don't have access to one, um, and it's, you, it's a DuxburySystems.com. You can download the Perky Duck free software. So it would produce like the dots in the appropriate place. Um, Hadley School for the Blind, um, the, they have workshops to learn Braille by sight um, for family members, friends, and caregivers. And last time I checked, those were free for excuse me, for family members or caregivers, um, they can register and take these classes free of charge um, if they have an individual um, with a visual impairment. They're personalized learning opportunities. Um, you do have instructors, I believe, for most of the courses. I don't know how the basic Braille workshops work. I know in some of the more in-depth Braille workshops, like you have to mail stuff back and forth between you and your instructor. Um, I'm not, like I said, I'm not sure as far as like the basic Braille courses, if that's, if that's true, my guess is that you probably use Perky Duck 
um, for some of that. And then the last resource before I moved on um, is Brailleug. So Brailleug teaches sighted children about Braille. It's recommended for about grades three, three through six. But in all honesty, I have family members and parents that will go into Brailleug. I think it's a great resource um, just to kind of play around and, and learn the basics of Braille. It definitely encourages literacy among the sighted um, in a fun environment. And it's packed with facts about Braille, information, games, graphics, and activities. So you can just Google Braille bug. All right, so before I go on to the final, are there, there, there are questions maybe about the Braille code? Well, there was one about, yeah, the, uh, one about are these free resources? They are, the ones that you just talked about, yes. yes. Yeah. Um, and then um, can we get a copy of the unified Braille chart? Um, yeah, I mean, I when I get out of here, I mm, oh, you know what? At the very end, I'll have my email and you who whoever needs that can email me and I will give them the link. Because there's some of them I like better than others and more clear. And I, I can't do it right now since I'm in here. Mm -hmm. um, but then I can show them where I was able to pull that up. Okay. Those, I found one, um, but it was by Aroga Technologies. I don't think that's the one that you have. You have one that's a little different. Yeah. Yeah. So I can I'll share wait. it with them. Yeah, I'll have I'll my wait email after that. if they want to do that. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, and let's see. Uh, Denise just mentioned about the Hadley that she's just recent taken a few of the courses at Hadley online free and self paced. So that was one comment and we took care of the free resources and I put in the links for the what you were just talking about and so we can go on. No more Perfect. questions so far. Mm -hmm. Perfect. All right. Okay, so just to, to wrap up, I just wanted to share with you um, a few pieces of equipment that you can use within the home to write braille. So the first one is a state slate and stylus. Um, <laughs> Aliyah, you can probably remember when I was going through the program, um, slate and stylus was not my favorite. Um, it's not, <laughs> but they are um, very ideal for quick and short notes and labels. And a positive is that you can take it with you. Um, I, you can see here in the picture, you can purchase slate um, of different sizes. So you can get like a full size slate or you can get a slate of just a few different rows. Um, the idea of a slate and stylus is that that slate, you can see in the middle picture, the top slate is open. And so you stick a piece of paper in, you shut the slate. And then with the styluses that they have here, you actually poke through those openings to make the braille. So um, that would indent the paper. It was not my favorite just because they say that it's not writing backwards, but I don't know how else to describe it because you have, yeah, you have to think of the mirror image, right? So if you wanted to make an A and then A is dot one, but you really need to poke dot four because when you take that paper out, you're going to flip it over. So when you're writing on a slate and stylus, you have to think about the mirror image and make that mirror image of the letter. Um, but they are ideal for just short notes, labels. Um, and like I said, you can put them in a bag and take them with you. Um, you can get different sizes and it's relatively inexpensive. The price ranges from anywhere like 10 to $20 for a slate and stylus. And I wanted to show you too, like, so these little styluses are what you can use to rub out a simple mistake. We were talking earlier to e erase a simple mistake. That's kind of what we would use to rub out if you don't have a good fingernail. Yep. Um, a braille labeler, <laughs> this is what I preferred when, um, uh, when my kids were younger. Um, a braille labeler, you can purchase these like on Maxi Aids or Amazon. Um, so you have the label tape in, and then you just turn that wheel to whatever letter you want to braille. You, you know, you line it up, you squeeze the trigger, and it's made the braille letter. And then you can keep going around to spell whatever you're wanting to spell, whether it's a name or object. And then you cut the label out and stick it to whatever you want around, around your home. So again, this is very um, 
easy and quick for short notes or labels um, and relatively inexpensive. You can buy um, one for maybe $35 on Maxi Aids or Amazon. I'm sure you can buy much more expensive ones, but um, for just short labels, you wouldn't need to. And then of course you can use a Perkins Braille Writer um, or the Perkins Braille Writer is what I have pictured above. The blue one in the lower is American Printing House's Light Touch Brailler. Um, Braille writers though are, are a lot more expensive than the other tools. They can run around $800. Um, when I work with my families, I always tell them to talk to the schools when their, kid, when their kiddos transition um, into you know, an early childhood program. Um, we've had a Braille writer in our home for the last 15 years. So once my, and I did not purchase it, it's, it's on a loan from the school. Um, the idea is if, if my children are going to learn Braille, if they're going to read and write Braille and expect to, you know, Braille things for homework, then they needed um, that piece of equipment in the home. So the schools um, sent one home because I was obviously, we weren't going to have a little three or four year old tote, a, a Braille writer that's heavier than them back and forth to school every day. So we've had one in our home to use for their school. And then obviously I can use it to make or create little notes or in cards or whatever. I like to adapt the kids' cards um, so that they can read their own birthday cards. People shouldn't have to read it to them um, or whatever we need to do. Make recipes, whatever we need to do. So those are just some pieces of equipment. And then here is my contact information. So like I said, if you're wanting that um, cheat sheet, just um, send me an email and I can send you a link to where I was able to find that cheat sheet. And, and of course, if you have any questions or concerns, I'm always glad to field any of those if you think of something later. Um, but we have a few minutes if there's anything that uh, anybody would like to ask right now. Yeah. Okay, there was a, a, I saw a, quote, a question and a comment. One of the comments was, uh, my understanding is that a slate and stylus wouldn't be used much by our children. Um, I mean, I think it's, I, you know, I think everybody's different. All teachers are different. I kind of follow around what the teachers do. I work with the, the zero to three population. So I very obviously, Rarely. I let families know slate and styluses are out there, but we don't use them. Um, my two children personally were introduced to a slate and stylus, but they never used, like they literally were just introduced just to let them know that it was out there. But again, they didn't use it. You know, as a teacher in the field, I'm sure everybody has a different opinion. Maybe some teachers um, push more of a lesson on a slate and stylus. I, I'm not sure. I personally, I think it's more of a child's personal preference as to what they want to use. So if, if either one of my children wanted to use a slate and stylus more then I mean, by all means, learn to use the slate and stylus. It's whatever I think that they're most comfortable with. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I'm with you on that. I mean, it all depends, right? Like you said, but I mean, it's like the way I was taught and the way I always kind of talked about it was that it's, it's like, it's like a pencil and paper for, mm -hmm. you know, like we have a, a pencil and paper in our bag or backpack. It's the same thing with the slate and stylus. However, if now there's like the braille notebooks, I mean, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Yeah. Um, they're yeah. not braille notebooks, but you know, the braille note touch and all like these the braille touches, yeah. that they're kind of there. That's what we were told too. When, uh, because they're like, you're not going to take a Perkins braille writer into a meeting no. and clunk, 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 and like take notes. Right. So like this slate and stylus was more, you know, to be more discreet for quick notes. But like you said, a I mean, technology just changes so quickly. Um, you know, I even think of Ethan and Alyssa now, I mean, they can whip out their iPhones and make notes on their iPhone, you know, yeah. and, and have it read back to them later on. So, um, yeah, I mean, I guess it all depends on, you know, your access to technology, how good you are with it. 
Um, and but in the meantime, while somebody's trying to learn the technology of Slate and Stylist might be a good way um, to offer them some independence without having to be near a Perkins Braille writer, something that they can just carry quickly in their backpack or in their pocket and take it out and, and use it because they come in different sizes too. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I put the link for the Mountbatten Brailler in the chat. So if anybody's Perfect. interested in that. Um, and then there's a suge any suggestions for washable Braille labels since clothes often need oh. to be washed? That's a good question. Washable Braille labels. Mm. I don't know of any. That makes me want to Google. <laughs> yeah, that's what I started doing right now. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, and it's so hard too because you know most of our clothes anymore don't have tags either. Um, oh, so many things are tagless anymore. Are you thinking of color? Hope, is that what you're thinking of? Like to identify something as color or like what goes with something? I'm looking to see. There's uh, labeling and marking. And I see that. Colors and the, oh, washing instructions. But that's the thing, right? Being able to a washable uh -huh. uh, colors and even washing instructions. Mm. I don't know. That's a really good one. We might have to ask a. a, a, a I'd be curious to see, like an adult, therapist. like what an adult does. Like I just think of what we do here in the home, as far as like how we organize clothes, so that they kind of know what goes with what, and mm -hmm. it's easier for Ethan because I mean he's a boy, right? Like anything <laughs> goes with jeans or khaki <laughs> shorts. But then you have Alyssa, who is like, "Ooh, you gotta be careful." There's a yeah. lot more colors and patterns. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's more of how we organize. Mm -hmm. um, and I try not to buy anything that's too difficult as far as washing. Like they're pretty good. They can wash. And as far as they just kind of throw everything together, we're safe. Um, but yeah, I'd be curious as to talk to an adult and see how, you know, that's independent, you know, lives independently and how they do that. Yeah. I mean, I, I found like braille patches where, you know, they could be sewn on or mounted on to clothing um, but then, of course, too, there are um, assistive technology. Uh, there's apps that you can use on your phone called like yeah. the, the one, Tap Tap C and a few other ones that will let you know about like what color your clothes are and things like that. So that that may be um, one option. Um, but that's a high tech option. I'm trying to think of low tech I've options. I've always been so. more like the color, too, is identifying the colors. Um, because then they need to know like not all colors match and not all blues are the same blue you know right. so then it's like you have one more to teach them on that too mm -hmm. um yeah are the braille patches elias some any resources for the braille patches are those washable well because they're sewn in it looks like they are in. yeah like you have to sew ah. them like yourself right like that would be um something that you would have to do yeah, yourself, like on some of these independent sure. living sites and stuff, you can find them. But I think a vision uh, rehab teacher, not a therapist, a vision rehab teacher, they're the ones who go into the home and help with just those types of things. Mm -hmm. um, so they would know the resources and stuff like that. Um, there mm -hmm. are a couple of places like Maxi Aids, may be able to find it. I'll put that in the um Maxi H has really nice things to help organize yeah. independent living and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm putting that because that sounds like more of an independent living um, mm -hmm. uh, like product. Um, but but it's still a good it's still a good question because I mean it, you know, never never too early to to try to start you know a training for that independence even though we don't want we never want to think our kids are going to leave us and be independent but <laughs> they will. <laughs> someday yes. <laughs> even if even when we don't want it to leave us that's um, right yeah um 
So I am just putting a couple of names. In Independent the chat. living aids. Yeah, that's a good yeah. one too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that might be a good, um, another good resource there. You know, for know. anybody out there younger, like one, one thing that we would do when the kids were younger is I would have different clips, different, um, different textured clips or different field clips. And so the bottoms, the, the, if, if something matched and went together, like the top and bottom, then they would have the same clip, if that makes any sense. So that's how they knew how to like match some of their clothes is that the tops and bottoms had to have the same clip. And then they would just take the clip off. And then when we did laundry, we would just put that clip back on. Not Sorry. real, but it was. Something. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. With safety pins, right? Um, so, okay, that safety pins would work, cope. And I've had um, families do, or other families that I know of, like you could put beads on those safety pins. So, like a safety pin with one bead, right, is going to match, or two beads, three beads. Like that's how you could make those coordinating outfits. I like that with the beads mm -hmm. and also depends on how old they are too. Right? Oh careful. yeah, absolutely. Again. Yes. <laughs> oh, I gotta be careful with those safety pins. <laughs> yes. Safety pins and beads. <laughs> and be Oh, that's true. And beads. That's right. Yes. Yep. <laughs> I know I poke but you know, I just went to a craft store for the clips and I was able to get like mini, like mini um, clothesline clips. And then, um, Oh gosh, they just had like a whole aisle of just different clips. So everything was, it, it definitely felt different. They all felt different. I had a whole stock of them. Um, but I, but the safety pins with the beads definitely work as well. If you're comfortable with, you could wash the safety pins. That's what, you know what, that's not a bad idea because mm -hmm. you wouldn't have to take the safety pins off. You could run those too. Yep. Exactly. That's a really good, that's a really good idea. I think APH sells a kit where they have like kind of like real beads or those plastic beads that you can, you can put on a safety pin or on a key, like a, a key ring. Um, and so if it's something like that, that's something that could be pinned to the clothes as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. That makes sense. Um, okay. Just some comments, great suggestions, good information. Um, I think we've addressed all of the all of the questions that have been in the chat so far. Great. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions before we start shutting down? Mm -hmm. No. Okay. I don't see any. Did you have anything else to add, Sarah? I do not. Okay. I do not today. Uh, Thank okay. you again for yeah. having me. Yeah, no, thank you. You always have the best, like just best information coming from a parent's perspective. Can't get any better than that. You know, <laughs> that's awesome with your experiences. So, um, okay. So for those who are, um, oh, well, I'll just, again, let me thank you, uh, Sarah, for presenting all this great information. Thank you everybody for attending our Braille 101. I hope it was really helpful. I know it was helpful for me. I always learn something new uh, when Sarah or, and Julia are on. Um, and so uh, be sure to um, come back to aphconnectcenter.org um, to, uh, there you can find a link to our webinars and you'll be able to find a link to our archive webinars where this webinar will be. Um, and um, I think I put all the other information um, that you need uh, in order to contact the APH Connect Center. And we are so happy that you were able to attend today. So please come back. We have Sarah and Julia again next month, um, which would be what the second I have it right here. Okay. It's early literacy and it's May 10th. Okay. May 10th for early literacy. So hope to see everybody back here. Um, and thank you all again for coming oh. and thank you again. To, uh -huh. Somebody needs the Oh, yeah. I see that. Yep. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks again, Sarah. And uh, we'll see you in a month. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Uh huh.